I'm delighted to be here today to be able to talk to you about Huntington lowering. My name is Peter McCulligan. I'm a HD neurologist. I've been working in Huntington's disease for over 10 years. More recently, I joined Roche and I work. Speak closer to the mic because it's. I, I work in Roche as a, what's called a clinical science leader. So I, I lead all the uh, clinical development programs in Huntington's disease in Roche. So the title of my talk today is called Huntington Lowering More Than One Way to Peel a Banana. This is courtesy of Ed Wild, if anyone knows him. Um, I am not Ed Wild. <laughs> he's, uh, he's very generously given me his slides as well. So I begin with disclosures. I'm a full-time employee at Botham in the Roche. The talk today is, is about Huntington Lowering in general. It's not intended as medical advice, and if you do need any medical advice, please speak to your HD physician or your doctor. I have to make a small note about adverse event reporting. This is done with any medicinal products that are registered, and, and this is via the NHRA in the UK. Okay, so let's get started. <coughs> How do we go from human being to DNA? So, as you may know, humans are made up of many, many cells. Inside a cell you have what's called a nucleus. A nucleus is the cell's operation centre, so it makes sure the cell does all the things that it needs to do to stay healthy. So inside that nucleus you have what's called chromosomes, and chromosomes are made up of tightly worn pieces of DNA. And a length of DNA contains information that's called a gene, and that gene can uh, be turned into a protein. So why is this important in Huntington's disease? The good news in HD is we know what causes all the problems. What causes all the problems is the Huntington protein. So we know that to attack the Huntington protein, to try and reduce the levels of the Huntington protein, we need to intervene in this process going from gene to mRNA to protein. And so if we think about the gene, genes are made up of two strands. One is called the sense strand, one is called an anti-sense strand. What happens is these two strands get unwound, a molecule comes along and reads one of the strands and turns it into what's called mRNA or messenger RNA. Then that mRNA gets turned into a protein. So this is the process that I'm going to focus on today. And the good news is that we can intervene along this process in many different ways to try and lower the Huntington protein. And the hope is that by lowering the Huntington protein, the protein that we know causes the problems, we can hopefully slow, stop, or maybe even prevent HD. So let's zoom in and look at this process in more detail. So we have the DNA in the nucleus, and in this case we have the mutant Huntington gene. So that gene undergoes what's called transcription to mRNA. And it first needs to be transcribed into pre-mRNA in the nucleus. And then there's a process called splicing. Splicing chops out bits of information in the mRNA that you don't need. And then exports it outside of the nucleus into the cytosol. And it's then called mature mRNA then that mRNA in the cytosol gets turned into the mutant Huntington protein. So we need to intervene along these steps to try and reduce the protein that causes the problems. So as I said, we have many ways of doing this. We have ASOs, or what are known as antisense oligonucleotides. These intervene at the pre-mRNA level. We have small molecules, or splicers. Uh, Amy Lee gave a great talk uh, earlier on about this. I'll go into a little bit of detail on it. We have RNA interference, and this is what's known as gene therapies, and Astrid from Unicure gave a great talk earlier about this as well. Again, I'll, I'll talk to you on this in a little bit of detail. We also have approaches that target the DNA, so ZFPs, which are known as zinc finger proteins, and CRISPR. I won't go into detail about these approaches, but these are also being looked at um, preclinically or in the lab. <coughs> okay, so let's start off with ASOs or antisense oligonucleotides. So as I mentioned, they bind to the pre-mRNA, and when the ASO binds, 
it sends out a signal to this guy. This is RNA's H, and they come along and they eat up all the mRNA, so that that then reduces the amount that can be uh, exported, and then consequently that reduces the mutant Huntington protein. Let's move on to the other approach. This is RNAi or RNA uh, interference. And using this approach, we have what's called the viral vector, and the vector is a way of getting it into the cell. And the vector contains what's called micro mRNA. And again, this binds at the mRNA, and it binds complementary to the mRNA strand and helps the degradation and then reduces the production of the protein. RNAi is slightly different because it interferes with the mRNA when it's in the cytosol. And it's delivered to the brain in a different way, and I'll, I'll touch on the delivery of these different mechanisms shortly. Okay, so let's go to small molecules or splice modifiers. Again, splicers interfere at the mRNA level, but they do something slightly different than the, the other approaches that I mentioned. So if we think about pre-mRNA, pre we have, sometimes we have stop signals that need to be chopped out to produce the mature mRNA that can be turned into the protein. What splice modifiers can do is they can insert a stop signal that prevents the production of this protein. And as I said before, the splicers act at the pre-mRNA level, but interfering with the splicing mechanism. Okay, so these different approaches are delivered to the body in different ways as well. So antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, they're given via lumbar puncture. So you may have heard of lumbar puncture before, or it can be known as a spinal tap. And here there's a small needle placed into the lower back, into the cerebral spinal fluid canal. The drug is injected and then it goes up to the brain and is taken up by the brain structures to have its effect. Typically gene therapy is via an injection into the brain, into the brain structure that's most affected in HD. <coughs> And this requires a brain surgery procedure. Then the splicers can be given orally, so this might be a tablet or it might be a liquid. So the, these different approaches target the, the process in different ways and, and, and they're delivered to the body in different ways. So just to summarize, we have ASOs that target the pre-mRNA and the nucleus. <coughs> we have small molecules or splicers which target the splicing process. We have RNAi, RNA interference that target the mRNA in the cytosol, and zinc fingers and CRISPR that can target at the DNA level. With that, I'd like to say a big thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and we can hand over to Lauren. Hi, everybody. <laughs> questions but um, he didn't mention that um, because of regulations in the UK there are a lot of restrictions on what people from pharma companies can say to patients um, or their population um, so I'm here to kind of be able to get I don't work on anything and so I'm not a employee of um, and Rush, um, or any pharmaceutical company so I can kind of say what I want to a certain extent um, <laughs> And I'm not Ed Wilde, um, sorry, I have to make that disclosure, but I can make things, explain things in a relatively simple way, so please ask questions if you need anything more. Um, and I can make some jokes. I'm trying to make mum jokes a thing, which Ed is a, the king of dad jokes, so. Um, and I can just add a bit more in terms of, you know, some of the companies, the players in the game that are working on different aspects of this. So we have Takeda, um, where they are, Looking at the the DNA level, they're making um, zinc fingers, as as um, Peter mentioned. This is all still preclinical, which means they haven't started testing this in humans yet. So this is something we might hear about in the future. Um, you might have heard of companies like Novartis and PTC. 
think even we did an excellent um, session earlier today and it will be recorded about the PTC program. Um, unfortunately, the Novartis program um, was stopped earlier this year, or last year, um, due to issues with um, adverse event, uh, events um, and some difficulty with the drug, but we um, are really excited about the PTC program. There are <laughs> multiple companies, including Roche, that work on ASOs and have different mechanisms. So Roche's pro, um, drug, Tom Nursen, is looking at um, lowering Huntington, both copies of the Huntington, so we have a good copy and a bad copy. Um, and then there's companies like William and Brickor that are developing ASOs that are trying to target only the mutant co um, copy and lower that mutant protein. Um, so we have had trials ongoing in early um, phase one, phase two, I think they're coming, are they finished? I don't think you can't say anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they're presenting results this year, um, so we look forward to that. And uh, is it FICO or Rico? Um, they are close to submitting um, to start their first in human studies, I think, in the next year or two. And then we have companies like Unicure Spark, and I think you've heard from Unicure already, or if you haven't been to that session, it is on, going to be online. Um, and they are using that, um, that vector approach, or gene therapy. So they are injecting this um, cool virus that isn't going to do bad things like COVID, but um, we're actually going to make use of the fact that viruses can get into parts of our brains and implant the, these instructions to make the drug. And then that's something that's more permanent. Um, so kind of sci-fi, but um, yeah, um, we're excited to see what, what comes out of that. So that's still um, ongoing. They started, there was a pause in um, that trial. I think um, a lot of this will be discussed tomorrow in the session from Ed Wild, which is a video <coughs> of his, where he's presented this before and can give more of an overview. So we'll definitely check that out. Um, that is us, so we'd love to hear any questions. I think Emma's got stuff in the app. Um, Does anyone have any questions? I don't know how to attach this, but I'll come with this. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I guess, like, not to be cynical, and it's, it's different in Canada, like our healthcare, as opposed to, like, in America, but, like, is there any concern around, like, the development of any of these technologies and kind of, like, the desire for profit? Um, you know, like influencing where these things might be available or anything like that? Shall I take this one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I know a lot of people think Florida are bad um, and only care about um, making money and things. And that may be true, but I would also add the fact that for a pharma company to make money, they need a drug to work and they need it to work in the pot and they need the population to want to use it so in a way we're aligned it's a mutual benefit um so i would argue against that their need for profit is not in line with our need for drugs um, and that's my opinion but again yeah if you have anything more specific though in terms of does that it might mean they drop programs that could be potentially um but beneficial if they looked at it a different way. Um, you know, I think different companies also have different resources and different um, priorities of what, and I get that's not always going to be in line with the communities, but we can't do it without them. As Charles said yesterday, we need, and that's why we need people like yourselves to come on board, and these companies are really willing to listen to the voices of you here. So um, things like HDCAB are really fundamental because I've, I do this in my own advocacy, talking to companies, because I can come at both sides of things. Um, I tell pharma people, like, this is your future customer. The, the young people in this room, this is, we want to stop Huntington's ever happening, so we need to be doing prevention trials and things like that. So we need to start listening to the real people that are going to be doing these studies and you know they do have to think differently about how they design trials and that's a new thing for for both us and the pharma companies any other questions yep what oh <laughs> thank you 
Hi, I'm Serena. Um, I was curious, are there researchers looking at ways to combine these techniques and see if there's any potential like synergy between them or whether like one could be used to like modulate another? Um, I was just curious about that. Do you have a general comment? On that? I, so in terms of the literature, I'm not familiar where people have done, you know, in terms of preclinical work, because I, I guess that if you were going to combine these therapies, that's where you would start, but I'm not aware of any papers where they've combined, say, splicers with ASOs or, or gene therapies. But I do think there's a general kind of viewpoint that it's probably going to be multiple drugs together that are going to have the biggest effect. So each of the drugs that we've mentioned have their own advantages and disadvantages, and it might it's probably going to need a combination of all of them to have the, the biggest effect. Um, but obviously that's very complex to test, and it, you know, it's hard to explain to everybody how long these things take. Um, but if we have one that works, you know, that's a stepping point. But um, the first generation of drugs are probably not going to be as good as, and then to the drugs further down the line. But you need to get those in the door to kind of build upon and as well as for the tools that we use. So I work in biomarkers um, and developing those. But until we have a drug that works, we can't then measure the response by biomarker and use that as kind of like a surrogate um, to go earlier um, until we, we know it works in the disease population. So all of these things, it's all cum um, cumulative, <laughs> it's a difficult word, and um, even the field trials, field trials um, or things, that, drugs that maybe didn't, weren't didn't meet their endpoints. We've all of the data is still there, and we're still learning a lot from, uh, like for example, the phase three Tom and Erston trial. There was so much data. This is one of the largest studies of Huntington's people, people with Huntington's disease, that have such rich, rich data that we can uh, that Ross are committed to keep on um, looking at and working with academics as well to understand that. Um, so it's, I know how disappointing it is, you know, as a per, um, when we hear these things, but it is still moving forward. It's still, it's not the setback that we think. Um, it's still, we're still further closer to understanding how to cure HD, um, even with those seemingly setbacks. And just to add to that, I think it's important to say that Huntington Lauren is a hypothesis. We don't know what approach might work, but by looking at multiple approaches in parallel, you know, across multiple companies, it's the quickest way that we can develop treatments that might be effective in HD. Yeah, and lots of scientists have different opinions on what's going to work, but at the end of the day, they can be cynical about one approach, but they're, we can't, as good scientists, you need to test your hypothesis and you need to you know, prove that something doesn't work. You can't just base it on a hunt. So unfortunately, we have to do these trials and really brave individuals that are are often doing this for their family members and everything else. So, um, yeah, credit to them. Um, I was just wondering, you said that uh, Roche was looking at the healthy gene and the mutant gene, whereas... Wave and Bico were just looking at the mutant gene. Mm -hmm. Is there any obvious, um, I guess, benefit to looking at lowering the healthy gene as well? Not in terms of actual data in these trials. Um, so in theory, we, we know how the Huntington protein is super important for normal function. We know that um, there, you know, you can't knock out the protein altogether it, we know it's really important. So that's where all of these programs have to be really tentative about how they approach um, lowering it because we don't, but none of them are trying to lower it completely for this reason. Um, so in theory, there's that's where the added advantage of wanting to try and target that, but it's really hard to do. And the approaches that are currently being used to select for just the, the bad copy um, might not be, what there's lots of caveats to that. So one way to do that with ASOs is these things called SNPs. They're basically unique markers that that people carry that have no effect to their genes, but they're unique to them. And they can design the drug around those that might cover 40% of gene carriers. You know, not all, everybody in that has the Huntington gene is gonna carry this, gene, this, this SNP. Um, 
so one of the reasons I, I believe that maybe a company would choose <laughs> a non-selective approach is because it, everyone could benefit from it potentially. Um, so that they're important to look at all these things because it's not one way is going to work for everyone. Um, yeah, I think we all, I think that's a big debate in the field and a lot of scientists are very, um, there's a lot of strong opinions of like we shouldn't be lowering Huntington at all or we shouldn't lower the good copy, but I believe that it's important to test. That was also my question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's one up there as well. I think. Do you want to go first? Uh, Claire, go ahead. Um, okay. Hi, i am uh, been in the hunting community a long, long time, and it's fantastic. You know, we're in a much better place than we were. Obviously, the I, mean, I know people who were on the Roche trial, um, and they have, you know, even, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the clinical endpoint, but I know there were people that were improved on it. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of disappointment amongst the community, especially those participants who saw improvements. It might be that it's Lauren that has to speak in terms of, but it'd be good to un understand I've, a yeah. bit about I mean, that and then a bit about, about the new, because there's going to be a new phase, phase two uh, a new sort of trial coming, isn't there? I would say just about Peter, first of all, that Peter w didn't always work for Roche and was um, <laughs> <laughs> um, worked as a doctor in these and actually injected patients with these the, the drugs. Yeah. So he had a lot of experiences of working with and seeing potential improvement in individuals. You can maybe come a bit more, or I can. Yeah, I mean, I. Um... So I, I was along with Ed. We were the first in the UK to, to. to um, Ed says he's be, the first in the world to have injected anyone. Okay. And he likes to hold that um, trophy. So I, 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 I was along that journey as a as a HD neurologist working at UCL. Um, so I, I mean, I I know personally how devastating it was for the community, and I mean, as as a HD clinician, I felt to be honest, I felt. A little bit of guilt because I think that I'm not sure we managed expectation as well as we could have done. Yeah, I w was going to add that it bring up placebo effects. Um, so if you don't know what a placebo effect is, when you take part in a trial or get a drug or any kind of treatment, a lot of people will get better, whether just by actively being in a trial and not whether. So there's people that are not getting the active drug and they're literally doing better, like for the first six months, their symptoms are better, everything are better. So, which is great, if we could just package placebo effect in a pill and, <laughs> and give that to everyone all the time and that worked, fantastic. But long term, that, so placebo effect tends to go away after six months, I think, um, or, well, I don't think there's, it's, no. it's not very well studied, um, so I shouldn't give definitive opinion on that. Um, so I think, it was very real that people felt better and I think it was even a bigger effect because of the gravity of this trial. It was the first ever Huntington lowering and everyone knew it was des this designer drug for Huntington's disease. Scientists were excited, doctors were excited, which creates a, a, a certain thing for patients and, and, and family members, like this is the new cure and everybody wanted to be on the, oh my God, like the people ringing us to get on the trial. I had people that find my number of websites and I'm not even involved in it, but because I did lumbar punctures, or we did lumbar punctures, they thought um, they could get in the trial that way. Um, so going back then to managing expectations, and it's one thing I always kind of become the negative Nancy of like um, explaining to people what, disease modification might actually mean mm. to them. So when we say slowing of disease, someone in that trial and their personal experience of that, whether their disease is slower or not, they're probably got, could get worse in that two years. That could still be a positive. Um, when you look at the grip level of the people that were on the drug and the people that weren't, they might have got worse at a slower rate than the ones that were not on the drug. Um, so that is still what we're aiming for, probably in the, the scientific and, and community. And I don't think it was communicated very well that that's what that meant. 
um, because I think a lot of the patients that took part in this really thought they were going to be cured of HD and, and their disease was going to stop there and then. Um, so I, I think I'm very passionate about making sure that, that expectations are, are really communicated because, you know, it's, there is a huge kind of suicide risk for these people. There was a lot of people that were affected by major depression when they started getting worse or when they had to come off it. Um, yeah, it's a hard thing to manage. Um, but it's a good thing to keep talking about. Yeah, and great that we've kept it as a fake, you know, there's a no, still... It's yeah, and I think, you know, it's really hopeful that we're still moving step, forward. You know. And I, I'm, you know, I think we should still be hopeful for every new trial. I think Absolutely. there's... Yeah. Hi, Esme. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, so my question was, uh, who is eligible to participate in the trials and how would they take part in participating if they wanted to? It's a great question. So every trial is different. Um, and I don't think we can answer any of these things. Oh, sorry. Um, so it's important with every trial, they all have different criteria and it really depends on what things. So in this session, we've talked a lot about Huntington lowering trials. Um, and they'll have a certain kind of idea of what they're trying to do. There's also still trials ongoing for drugs that might be um, helping specific sy symptoms of PhD. I think like Sage Therapeutics have things, I think they're cognitive. I can't remember. I, I you can answer that. <laughs> Yeah, um, and they might have a different group or different things that they want to test. So, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to that. You have to be talking. That's why things like being part of Enroll um, and engaging with a clinical site or research team will allow you to be exposed to... If, you're, if you say you're willing to be a part of things, you're on their radar and you're ready and primed to take part. So... If you're interested in trials, I think get, get into Enroll HD. That's the easiest way to be engaged, engaged and form, informed for that. Um, if anyone's gene positive uh, or te not gene positive, it can be gene negative as well, but tested, um, HD YAS is still recruiting, um, which is a study at UCL, which if you go see Mina, <laughs> do not <a> plug. <laughs> he's got a booth. Um, if you're in the UK, that is. Um, but um, there, there's lots of opportunities. But I think that's the easiest way to stay. If, you're, if you really want to be in part of trials in the future, start getting involved and enroll. That usually opens other doors for other research studies. Um, and then... So the criteria that they use is a lot, there's lots of different things. So it might be what age you are, what um, what your CAG repeat length is. They calculate a kind of a research measure for your disease burden. It doesn't mean anything to you or like clinically, but it's a it's a useful tool for research to kind of estimate where what stage you are and your progression before. Um, if you don't have symptoms and things. So um, they will, the, the HDISS or integrated staging system has been mentioned today and I think it'll be talked more in Ed's session tomorrow. Um, that's a new tool, research tool that's been developed to try and move a bit earlier. So historically research is focused in this idea that you, have, you are pre-manifest before you have a certain amount of movements and then it's we talk about manifest, which we actually mean motor manifest. And that's historically how diagnosis has been made for HD. We know that people who have symptoms have often had lots of things changing before they get that definitive diagnosis. Um, there's lots of brain changes and things that happen. So we know we need to go earlier. We need to start doing trials earlier um, if we're going to prevent it. So that's why this new research tool will be important because it brings in other measures like biomarkers of um, in the brain, brain scans and, and, and things like that so we can actually run trials earlier. Um, I feel like I've rambled a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just gone three, so we're going to have to wrap up. But thank you so much to our speakers. Should we give them a round of applause? <laughs>